five seconds to submergence. Submergence deep into the absurd. All right, we got Niall Alexander. He's the host of the Nihilist Enigma YouTube channel. It's an amazing YouTube channel, kind of going over a lot of existentialist, uh, absurdist, nihilist, uh, all these types of philosophical thought. And there, there's a lot of narratives, and it's just beautifully written, beautifully narrated. It's amazing, and I appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, thank you so much. I, uh, I'm glad to hear that my work is appreciated. I put it out there mostly just to, uh, to get the thoughts out there and hopefully invoke in other people thoughts and ideas they may not have fully gone through themselves and try to do it in a way that's displayed nice too. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that kind of misunderstand nihilism. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, like, well, there's also people who, I mean, they understand it, but maybe they're more so uh, uh, pessimistic nihilists Definitely. rather like than when, optimistic nihilists. When you hear the word uh, nihilist in, in common culture or whenever you hear it, it's most often used uh, interchangeably with like fatalism or pessimism. People think, oh, nihilism, nothing means anything. Uh, automatically, they jump to the pessimistic uh take on it but that in my uh view misses what is profound about the concept in that it draws attention to the fact that meaning is and only ever has been of minds outside of the context of minds yes everything is meaningless but that foregoes the realization that it is only within the context of a mind having thoughts that such an idea such phenomena as meaning comes into being and consequently it, it leaves being it, it stops existing when we stop existing and i think that's that's where people get hung up on but like you can be optimistic about it you can go okay nothing means anything so why would i regret anything why would i worry about certain things or like maybe it makes you reevaluate your values in a way that is meaningful or you can go the pessimistic way and be like oh nothing means anything why bother doing anything why bother eating or like existing at all and it's uh it's a, it's a balance of the two more than any, even though, uh, yeah, most often you're going to hear the negative part of it because people really like to, uh, to cling to concepts of meaning that they invent. Like God is a great one. The concept of an eternal soul is, a is another one, like things that give people great sources of meaning. Uh, yeah. Nihilism sort of calls into, uh, calls into the attention that is, it's just phenomena of mind, which makes people uncomfortable. Yeah, people attach themselves to something permanent in an impermanent world. Something external, something beyond their mm -hmm. own mind. They, they try to put meaning, like there's this trope of we look for meaning, we search for meaning, yet meaning is only ever going to come from your mind. Like if you look at something and find it beautiful, that sensation of beauty only exists within your mind as you manifest it. It's not something that is external. Like if I'm looking at a beautiful sunset, the sunset isn't beautiful. It's my mind portraying beauty and manifesting beauty from what I see for whatever reason, but it is only completely internal. And though we would like it to be external, so it lasts more than we do. And so it's like something bigger and greater than us. It is unfortunately not the case. Yeah, it's, I mean, all of this just comes from you, the individual. It's, it's your thoughts. I mean, we're, I mean, people talk about, you know, do we live in a simulation? I mean, yes, we all live in a simulation. Your brain simulates reality exactly, for yeah. you so you can see it, right? I mean, exactly. that's just how it, it may is. not be, like, if it's simulated on an external hard drive or if it's simulated from your neurons manifesting what we perceive as a consciousness, either way, it is a, a phenomenon that manifests out of, out of the pieces and laws of the universe. And it isn't, like that it, it's magical in a way that it's like really interesting and crazy, but it's not like mystical and supernatural. It's, it's, it's bound to our biology. The mind manifests as a result of the processes of the brain. Mm. And I mean, you know, I'm not one to say, Oh, I mean, it might be, 
this process is sort of mystical. I mean, it's a mystical experience. I mean, it might yeah, not like definitely. actually have like, you know, supernatural affair to it, but it's, it's, it's definitely a spectacular. Strange. Yeah. It's, it's extremely strange. We don't know anything about it. We don't know if the, if consciousness arises from the, or if, uh, sorry, if consciousness exists inside of the brain or the brain is like, um, essentially like hooking up to consciousness like if consciousness is some fundamental property right yeah that's that's where our minds like to go because we're uh we have that innate fear of death us existing as yes. conscious minds we have it deep within us that we don't want to not keep existing as minds so any series of ideas that can humor the possibility that consciousness is something greater than us is something that we are going to adhere to that's why myths of afterlifes have have persisted throughout our entire uh our entire time as a, as a species, as a, as a species that kept track of like language and stuff and ideas. So the past hundred thousand years or so, uh, but this, what we understand close more and more uh, by like study, studying neurology and studying like, sorry, studying uh, brain damage in specific cases and like, uh, like lobotomies when, when fucking in the, in the U S in the fifties, they thought it was a good idea to poke a needle or an ice pick into the brain and mush it around a bit in order to change someone's personality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when in reality, they were actually just damaging people beyond like we've learned that, uh, like you can make a, a, an argument that can kind of work in a bit like that. Uh, the brain is a conduit to consciousness that if you damage the brain regions, then you're damaging the way it can connect to the larger consciousness, but it's, a, a bit of an Occam's razor, uh, Occam's razor situation where you begin to overcomplicate the situation when uh, neurology and the uh, image mapping nowadays can can see like as you have certain thoughts, we can see where they manifest in the brain, or as you're like doing a certain task, it'll light up a certain area of the brain associated with those tasks. So we're starting to refine where language areas are in the brain and where movement takes place in the brain and where like uh, where's the sense of heat and touch. We're starting to realize the exact actual physical locations in your actual brain where these phenomena manifest and we're starting to to realize more and more that the mind is what the brain does so it's uh it we have to fight something within ourselves to come to terms with the reality of death to come to terms with the fact that we may in death might be identical to that eternal abyss that we emerged from all of us like that millions and millions of years before you were arranged in a way capable of manifesting a consciousness that might be identical to what we are going towards. And you might only have this temporary period of time when you're arranged in a way that can manifest thoughts and consciousness and this weird fucking thing that we call life, but it's, it's temporary. And in that temporariness, I think is, uh, is how we find any, any semblance of what meaning actually could be like in acknowledging that we are temporary beings and we all must, must suffer the loss of each other. We all must struggle to not be alone and to find food and to like deal with our health. We are, we're all bound to and manifest from these, uh, these, these flesh, this, this thing that we are, this, this reality that we find ourselves emerging within. And, and in that, I think we can even found foundations for things like morality uh, in that, like, by just realizing that you just like me exist in this world where we both have to suffer the same things and struggle for food and like we're co-inhabiting in the common struggle as Christopher Hitchens put it uh, and on that foundation we can look at each other and we can see in each other conscious beings that that are worth respecting and worth like treating in a way that we would want to be treated just by understanding what we are bit of a tangent there but i think that morality comes into play with it once you uh once you start to really internalize what we are and what we manifest from i mean People yeah think. there's been uh studies that say that when um when shit hits a fan people actually end up being kinder to each other yeah they're uh, more empathetic they want to help each other out and when things are easy it's it's the opposite of that people are <laughs> a little bit more conniving and selfish uh, yeah. yeah yeah because you're not um Cause like the thing about uh, life being easy is that you, you can see people suffering and then you're like, Oh, well, I'm not suffering, whatever. But when everyone's exactly. suffering, you're like, Oh God, we got to help each other out. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I know uh, you said something there um, about, about how like, yeah, people like want to uh, they have a tendency to go 
into these beliefs of the afterlife and having something there after death. And I think part of that is like they want control, but also, I mean, obviously the uh, the fundamental goal of life is to survive. So like people are like, yeah, oh no, yeah. we're going to die. Like, oh, no, no, there's going to be an afterlife. But I think, I think, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I heard something uh, the other day, I think it was on the Tangentially Speaking podcast, or it might have been somewhere else, maybe on a, a YouTube video or something. I don't remember. But either way. Uh, but this guy was saying like, okay, why do people adhere to conspiracy theories? Well, because there's a bunch of complicated things, because when there's a bunch of complicated things going on that you can't control, um, that like no one's in control of, and it's just like horrible, there's no way to stop it. Um, no one has control over it. They like to invent yeah. a conspiracy theory because conspiracy theory kind of puts it like, oh, there's one group that's it responsible for everything. Yeah, yeah, it simplifies it. Then they're like, oh, if we take down that one person, that one idea, that one group, then all our problems will be solved. Nope. Yeah, there's also the phenomena of like wanting to be beholden to information that other people aren't, like feeling special and that you've come to understand something that other people are blind to, like the flat earth or moon conspiracy or all these all these things that uh, that make you think, Oh, there's this big, this big thing that everyone's trying to cover up and people are so blind to it, but I see through it. So it's a sort of, uh, sort of way of affirming, uh, individuality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, reaffirming individuality. Yeah. That's a good. One. I mean, we are all individuals, but, and we like to attach ourselves to this body, this identity, like, Oh, I'm me, I'm this, we try to um, when, attach ourselves to ideas that outlast us. It seems yeah, all the time. yeah, and that too. I mean, why? Like, why did I start this podcast? Right? I mean, why did you start your YouTube channel? Exactly. I mean, these are two things that'll probably still be somewhere in the YouTube that database after they will like, definitely outlast us. <laughs> like these thoughts that we're that we're manifesting right now will definitely outlast the beings that are putting them out there into the internet. Yeah, which is an interesting thought to have. Also, uh, in, in a similar vein, a bit of a tangent, though, uh, on, on nihilism, I wanted to talk about how language itself, how these sounds that I'm making right now don't actually have any meaning. Like, they, they're just a series of noises that your brain has been trained to recognize as something that manifests ideas. But just like a Chinese person talking right next to you, it would just sound like noise to you or just like dolphin chirping underwater or birds chirping. It just sounds like noise. But within the context of a mind, it roots itself and manifests meaning. Hey man, you don't know if I speak dolphin or not. <laughs> True. I, I'm sorry. I did not mean to assume. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no what did you call my mother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you. I was actually, uh, when we were talking about meaninglessness um, or meaning, when we were talking about manifesting meaning inside of yourself, um, at the beginning, I was thinking, yeah, I mean, the word meaning is just a meaningless sound, right? It's really the, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the feeling, it's the feeling uh, yeah. that, uh, that gives you meaning. Like, it's strange that meaning itself, though, because it can be so many things like feeling yeah. pain in the cold can be a type of meaning or the sensation of beauty or hatred or like a good tasting meal is a type of meaning. It's just your brain taking information and then attributing to its significance. So meaning is, is really entirely and utterly of the brain and of the mind. And outside of the context of a mind having thoughts, it, uh, it really doesn't make sense. So when people latch on to nihilism thinking, oh, it means everything is meaningless. It's like, well, yeah, when you're not a thinking brain having thoughts, but when yeah. you're thinking brain having thoughts, meaning sort of comes with the whole package. It's sort of inevitable. You can't not attribute meaning to things. Seeing colors or hearing certain sounds and attributing to them meaning like these these words I'm saying. I mean, that's uh, I mean, that's the the knowledge of the good and evil, right? That's the forbidden fruit consciousness. Yeah. Um, not to bring like a biblical thing in here, but um I've been thinking about that story a lot lately. Uh, the Adam and Eve. I don't know if you ever read uh, Ishmael. Well, uh, oh, Ishmael. I've, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, dude, you got to check on Ishmael. It's kind of a, an environmental philosophy book. But once you read Ishmael, you're like, dude, wow. <laughs> um, I've always had a, a problem with the very uh, 
the idea of like ancestral guilt of the ancestors yeah. doing something and then the kids having to also the uh i think hitchens was the final name nail in the coffin because he destroyed the very uh the concept of uh what was it what did he call it uh vicarious redemption of being redeemed redeemed through someone else through someone else's actions having your responsibility for your own actions removed yeah. from your uh from your soul or your being i don't think that's uh that's a philosophy i can jive with because i think that your individual sins your your trespasses your the, the bad things you do to other people that's on you to resolve and you can't seek forgiveness through some entity that lived before you and, and it, it makes mm. much more sense that these these ancient books written by ancient people is just the way that our ancestors coped with the situation they found themselves with it yeah because they they were manifesting consciousness they, they were minds coming into being in a world that is fucking like what the hell how who like how do you make sense of what the fuck is going on yeah. what is that glowing ball in the sky why does everything hurt why am i hungry like how do you make sense of yeah. what the fuck the world is in a time when there's no large hadron colliders or microscopes or or a system yeah. of uh of intersubject subjectivity like science yeah. something to break down the the barriers of like what we we just claim and feel is true to figure out what actually like maps onto reality and what is actually true of the the collective situation we find ourselves within Hmm. But they're also kind of lucky because I think uh, they might have had a little bit more wonder to the world. Well, in part, eh. but the wonder just changes context. Like there, there's yeah, wonder in, in not knowing in like the mystery of of deities and souls and all this stuff. But there's also wonder in like actually figuring out how the heck we manifest and how something like a mind having thoughts and perceiving itself can can arise out of such like simple but complex mechanisms as the interactions of like atoms and and quantum mechanics like stuff that goes over my head but i i can still realize that like though i would like to believe in something like a god i would like to believe that my life was imbued with purpose from the start and planned out and i would like to believe that death isn't the annihilation of the self and all these things that like I, th I think it's a very easy trap to fall into that if you want something to be true, like it or not true in this case, that it's really easy to trick yourself into thinking that it is the case. So if I really wish that I mm -hmm. don't die when I die, then it's really easy to find justification for that mode of thinking. But I, I think in order to, uh, in order to, to become the Ubermensch, uh, as Nietzsche put it, you need to internalize nihilism. You need to come to terms with the reality that, meaning is and only ever has been something that arises from minds and will never be anything beyond that. And we need to like see the world and see each other for what this situation actually is. And from that manifest a world worth living in. Cause I think because so many people are rejecting death and pretending death isn't a thing. And like with all of their being hoping that it isn't a thing, we lose sight of like life. We lose sight of the valuable the value of an individual life or the importance of lifting nations out of poverty or the the significance of uh individual moments or individual like just, just experiences like things that are finite yet yeah profound in nature yeah it's like oh wait you know i'm not actually yeah, immortal it recontextualizes you know? everything <laughs> like yeah, you know, like like I'm gonna die. I'm not actually gonna go. Well, you'll you know, go just back to where you to came paradise from. for the all stuff that things. like is you right yeah. now, sitting on a couch, having thoughts. Like the physical substance that is you was once flowing through the oceans and the rivers, and was once on random mm -hmm. fields grazing, being grazed on by random animals. That you were once like the actual stuff that currently is arranged in a way to manifest a mind was just spread across the planet, not even a hundred years ago. Like you existed i mean seven well, days yeah, even ago. seven days ago the stuff that is you has changed but like a hundred years ago the entirety yeah. of what you are now was just scattered across the surface of the planet and yeah when you die that happens again but yeah. like instead of getting lost in how scary mm -hmm. that is or how sad that is that you will one day be annihilated it's better to focus on how profound it is to ever have existed in the first place because no matter what, no matter what we think about yeah. it, no matter what we feel about it, we are going to be annihilated when we die. Like you can believe otherwise, that's cool, but like it happens and it's unfortunate. And like uh, there was a really good quote, I forget who it was by, but it essentially goes, uh, reality is that which when you stop believing in it doesn't go away. So reality is that which remains true regardless of what you believe. 
Yeah, I shoot, dude. I heard that quote the other yeah. day as well. I yeah, where I, I heard that from. Was that on? I, I might have channel? said. I might have quoted it in uh, in one of my videos. Yeah, actually, I haven't. Uh... But shoot, but but yeah, yeah. I mean, reality is the thing that um, it it stays there, like uh, regardless of what like where you are who you are like well, it's always been what there. i mean more is what you believe regardless of what like you can believe certain things about reality but what is true remains yeah. true regardless of what we believe so my goal in uh, in my philosophy yeah. is to try to figure out what the heck is actually true of this situation we find ourselves in because i know there's things that i want to believe but those aren't the things that i want to focus on because it's easy to mislead yourself when you focus on the things that you just want to be mm-hmm I think it's important to kind of uh, not attach yourself to any yes. idea, not be enslaved by Don't identify an by ideal. your beliefs. Because when, yeah, yes, yes. Don't identify by, I mean, don't buy, uh, don't identify by anything. Yeah, by any single yeah, thing. Um, any idea um, or set of ideas. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe. I mean, at least some to maybe uh, structure your life. We have to we have to pretend certain things in order to live. We have to pretend that (laughs) money is a thing that has value in order to to go to the store and get food. But like concessions and your actual internal philosophy are different. Yeah, I mean that's a thing with money. I mean, it's kind of one of those things that I mean everyone has to have faith in it. Yeah, yeah, it's a nebulous concept that sort of just got a hold on us way back in our species infancy. And it's, it's just how the whole world has been run. So we're so deep in that system of thought and in that system of organizing a life that if we try to uproot ourselves from it, we are likely to just end up with a situation where people are killing each other and people are starving because uh, uh, it incentivizes like a, a greed me versus you mentality. And when you have that instilled in the population yeah. for generations and generations, good luck making it a world where resources are distributed in a way that is like coherent with the amount of people that actually need the resources. Have you ever heard the song I Hunger haven't. Strike by Temple of the Dog? Good about it. Um, Oh um, man, you're just gonna have to check it out. It's an it's I just an awesome song. It's kind of a right now. What was it called? Temple of the Dog. Yeah, Temple of the Dog is the artist. It's called Hunger Noted. Strike. I will check that out after this. It's kind of about a, uh, um, I mean, it's about yeah. hunger basically, but it's about how you know there's a lot of people out there who are kind of just too powerful. And they're kind of hoarding all their wealth, and while there's like other people starving to death and like out in the streets killing each other. The there's a really sad thing about capitalism in that uh, I've realized a little while ago that it, it's kind of a situation that'll probably never change for one one overwhelming reason, and that reason is uh, the people with the most power to change things also have the most interest in keeping things the same. So the people with the most money, the most wealth, the most power in the world to actually influence the world also have the the most interest in keeping the world exactly how it is, because this is the world that made them rich. Yes, but I do have to say that, I mean, some people, some super rich people are. Yeah, some people world. have have standards uh, of ethics, but unfortunately, right. like uh, the, the top five richest people, the oil moguls and whatnot are. Are, are most interested yeah, in keeping yes, the yes. world running in oil and keeping the world running in a way that just keeps the money flowing in their direction. They have the most incentive incentive mm-hmm. to use their money to bribe politicians and get certain policies in place and like keep the world in a direction that just keeps the money flowing to them. And they don't, the goal is not to like feed the most amount of people or like get the most amount of people educated and in a position where their lives aren't full of suffering. That's not the goal under a world like this. The goal is to keep money flowing in the directions that they have. Yeah. But I don't think that's really a problem of capitalism. I think that's more so a problem of power. And yeah, power no, I think people. it's a problem of psychology of how people, uh, how people think yeah. about power and think about like possessions and, and wealth and, like they, they don't see the amount of wealth that they have as the amount of responsibility that they have to their fellow human. They see the amount of wealth they have as a personal collection of power and might that they can use at their godlike whim. Like they- mm, yes, yes. Because, I mean, the thing about capitalism is that it does 
give people like the ordinary person more freedom in part yeah it's a good way um, to keep track of resources yes yes in part yes yes it's a good way to keep track of resources and it's a good way to uh produce growth and innovation but the problem is um when it's unchecked unregulated uh people will accumulate too much wealth and they'll hoard it and they'll do things that is against the common interest it seems to be a situation else. though that where people with the most money rig the system in a way that like keeps them yeah. getting more and more <laughs> so it's it's a feedback loop sort of yes. and i don't know how you could ever fix it like it's it's a useful thing keeping like using tokens to keep track of resources but when it's become a situation where you need the very tokens to even afford your daily bread and stay alive you got to work to earn your very right to be alive while certain people like have so much wealth that they could feed the entire nation a buffet meal three times over like it's it's become a situation where it's so broken that it's hard to see hope in it because the power is is so so skewed in one direction that like I don't know. It, it's it's a uh, it's scary because you don't. Uh, there should be some hope, and it seems pretty hopeless when there's that much power in the hands of so few. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, that's a. It's a tough. I mean, it's a tough topic to tackle. Yeah, for sure. Tough topic yes, to that's tackle. A lot of <laughs> but because it's a. Uh, it's kind of one of those things where, I mean, it could be a lot, a lot yeah, worse. Luckily, like where we are in our situation, we can still purchase food and whatnot. We're, we're doing good enough to, yeah. to look at it and say, well, at least we're getting by. So there's that. But unfortunately, I think we've been lulled into a, a, a sense of complacency in some ways. Like the world is so over overwhelmingly the way it is that it doesn't seem like any change can actually happen like there's no way that it, it just it, it makes my stomach turn when grocery stores overstock food and then lock the dumpsters behind there uh behind the grocery stores and dump leech on them so homeless people can't get food it's it's like when profits matter more than suffer than the yeah. reduction of human suffering then you started to to go into dystopian territory and we're no longer it's no longer an innovative tool to push society forward but it, it it's a dystopian mechanism mm-hmm. and yeah and i mean i won't even go into the fact that i mean uh, overpopulation is a thing i mean there's way too many people on this planet for it to be sustainable. yeah with our current means of uh, resource production um, for sure yeah, I mean, and part of that is perhaps uh, the yeah, inequality, right? Undoubtedly. Um, because, I mean, the super rich will want there to be more people because if there's more people, that's more production, that's more productivity, that's more efficiency, yeah. that's more money. Yeah, but people aren't right? people to them. People are just numbers. Yeah, I mean, I think it was Stalin who said, uh, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah, unfortunately, the uh, the few times beyond Soviet Russia that communism has tried to take roots has been stomped out uh, by coups and whatnot. But that's uh, a topic for a different discussion. We should loop back to the central point. I believe we're getting into a. Oh uh... uh, yeah, I did have one thing to say about that though, because I know. Uh, so my teacher was telling me because uh, he's from gotcha. Romania, and when he was. 17 the soviet union fell and when he was like a little kid all the stores were running low they people were starving left and right because it just uh because essentially it was like i mean it was totalitarianism well yeah there was this is a dictatorship it wasn't uh in a quote-unquote communist system true to like the writings of Karl marx it wouldn't be there would be complete accountability to the point where no person could manipulate the uh like amount of resources they could there couldn't be any high-ranking generals who get more than the the common people it wouldn't be like the only reason the only way you could make a system such as that that was actually functional is if an ai ran it and there was no people involved in the process whatsoever because people are greedy and there would always be like there, there would always be inequality but now uh, we got a problem we, right <laughs> yeah like what an ai even care yeah yeah well that kind of brings us back to nihilism right i mean uh i mean if you're a robot can a robot have an experience like you and me can a robot have a meaningful experience 
it would just be something entirely different from us. And I think that we couldn't even imagine it because the software, the like hardware that we're using to form thoughts right now just isn't shaped in a way that we could possibly even sympathize with whatever we manifest. And I think, unfortunately, we are going to create something that would represent intelligent life and it may be accidental or maybe intentional, but it won't have our interest in mind. It won't have thoughts, anything like our thoughts are. It won't perceive things like we do and, and, it might not care at all for anything to do with us. It might just like use our resources and get the fuck out to space, or it might wipe us out entirely seeing us yeah. as a threat to its existence and as a bunch of stupid apes who would like be better at to serve it, serve it than we would to rule it. Mm-hmm. It's with a, a super intelligence with a, a machine or a, a being that could have so much of a mind, so much more vast than the entirety of, of our species. It's hard to, to relate to it or to think that we could control it or to think that it would have like any systems of thought in line with our own or that it would like even see a point to existing like if it would just power itself down or like yeah the, it's hard to hard to sympathize with something like that because it's so far out of what we can comprehend and then be very separated from us it wouldn't feel like us we'd be something else to it yeah, like even if we uh, we did the thing where you like scan your brain into a machine and mm. you have a copy of you existing on hardware, on a machine hardware, and it talks like you and it quote unquote thinks like you, at least in your interactions with it, the way that it thinks and the way that its consciousness is structured would be so foreign only just because it's not structured on neurons, it's structured on transistors. It would be like a, a different mode of thinking. It's like silicon-based beings. Have you ever seen The Boys on Amazon Prime? I've seen reviews. I've not seen the actual show, though. Yeah, I mean, so it's about superheroes, right? But yeah, but, but, it's but in the more main brutal, realistic. Yeah, yeah. The main thing is that it's about power. Okay. Right. It's, it's about social power. power. It's about um, physical power. Uh, yada yada yada. Right. Yeah. And when uh, when you're super powerful, like you know, when you have like uh, like laser vision, you can you know you're super strong, you're super fast, you can fly. Yeah. Or- and all or that. the equivalent billions of dollars and <laughs> yes yes you're completely disconnected from from everyone else in the world of course it's hard to relate to people unless you disconnect mm-hmm. yourself from it and you don't identify by these powers you have and make like make them let you think that you are better in any way or above or different in any way than the average mm-hmm. person you gotta it, it's hard for people to just center themselves and realize that you're experiencing a reality right now but so are other people and it's yeah. nearly identical to what you are perceiving like you get hungry you get sad you get itchy you like have to take shit sometimes like every like we're just yeah. we're just sentient minds floating in a void and things like our social systems of like we're just like dressing up in a certain way or just just things that we use to divide us and, and separate each other are just yeah ways or uh, systems of value that aren't worth attributing attributing mind to. Like nihilism allows us to, in part, uh, recontextualize systems of value like vanity or like uh, just different social structures, like thinking that a rich person is worth more than you or a celebrity is worth paying attention to, or like just these things that that your mind can go to if you are distracted and you don't pay mind towards like thinking about why you're valuing what you're valuing, then it's easy to lose track of, uh, of what is actually worth valuing and what is worth like praising and what attributes in someone. Like, I think, I think Bill Gates with his, his, his philanthropy and and charity is more uh, worth praise than like the average, average, like, joe amazon collecting a couple hundred more billion dollars (laughs) yeah uh, no i agree and i think elon musk like trying to get humanity to mars is like pretty cool yeah i i've got my uh i've got my gripes with musk uh, yeah (laughs) he's got his eyes too far out into space and not not on the like there's there's a lot of people screaming right now and and starving right now and Mm. suffering right now and dying right now yeah every moment of every day and with the amount of resources that someone like his him has you could start to uh you could start to implement technologies and you could start to found like build roads in nations that don't have infrastructure and you could start to build like Mm. power production plants and water purification plants and start like building schools and and just just 
help people to exist in this world that is so terrible to exist in sometimes like help life be less painful for your fellow human before you start worrying about going to other planets and and dancing on the frontier of technology like we have to we have our eyes too far out in the stars and we're losing sight of the people who are behind us and the people who are constantly like suffering and struggling to get to the the basic position of having a a place of their own and like a consistent meal coming to them yeah i mean he's kind of working on yeah (laughs) yeah exactly before before we we, exactly that's a good way to put it even started we've dealt with the planet but here's the thing with that, you know, so the one good thing that I'll say about going to Mars and like trying to, you know, terraform it or whatever, is that if there were to be a huge asteroid that crashed yeah, into the plan. Earth, it's a tether. Uh, yeah. Humanity would be boom, done, and done, unless we had Mars. Right, unless we were even that though, like well. I've I've thought about that a lot, like the the situation of a asteroid smacking into the planet, or uh, like a gamma ray burst halfway across the galaxy, wiping half the yeah. planet sterile. Uh, I think no matter what, there would be people who survive simply because there are enough rich people in bunkers with enough stockpiled resources that yeah. their their <laughs> genes would survive. Uh, so like even if the planet did become a hell for a hundred years, and like there was a, a nuclear winter or a, an ash cloud winter from an asteroid impact. There would yeah. be survivors in our species just because the amount of wealth that some people have been allowed to accumulate and what they've been able to do with that wealth. Yeah. Like there'd be That's bunkers of, of just tiny populations. And we've been squeezed through bottlenecks before our species. In our uh, DNA, we found evidence for it being uh, down to like yes. just 100,000 members or just 10,000 members of our entire species before repopulating. And we'd also probably be a lot better off trying to survive here in a nuclear like, yeah, wasteland yeah, than we would on Mars, which is like 90% CO2 atmosphere, with no atmosphere. And, like low gravity. <laughs> yeah. and you'd have to live in a little bubble. Yeah. I think even, even if this world did get fucked up real bad, it would still be a more habitable place than, uh, than Mars is currently. Yeah. And like terraforming Mars, like we can't even terraform. Yeah. We're Earth not even yet. doing good I mean, at controlling the collapsing ecosystems that surround us. We're, uh, yeah yeah so it's a little un- i mean it's extremely unrealistic to think that we can terraform that when we can't even terraform our own yeah. planet sorry this uh, uh cosmic mindset has got me thinking a little bit about gods which gets me looping around back to uh just a thought about how uh you know how when someone becomes an atheist or someone announces that, that they're an atheist to a religious family or like religious yeah. people tend to have a big problem with it they think that you're an atheist what you must be evil like it's 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 essentially equated (laughs) equated to me in my mind what people like the common person thinks a nihilist is it's like oh you're a you're a terrible person like what the average person thinks a nihilist is is what a religious person thinks an atheist is and uh what what people uh who are religious mostly have an issue with in atheism is the loss of meaning that comes with loss of a belief in god Mm -hmm. When you, when you believe in a god, when you believe in a quote unquote higher power that controls your fate and is watching over you and all these things, it becomes central to the concepts of meaning that you form, like the, the, the foundation of like how you get through hard situations, the death of loved ones and like how you like get through existential crises of like, is there a plan? I don't know. It, it becomes central to all these, these, these foundation, these uh, poor meaning things. And when someone realizes that gods are phenomena of mind it is like saying that your your pillar of meaning is uh is a phenomena of mind and in that they're not dealing with anything but nihilism and i think that itself was what uh what nietzsche was pointing out in inventing the term and in talking of nihilism was how it itself is the threat that is faced when belief in god cease and when Mm. traditional systems of value traditional systems of heaven and hell and good and evil and all these things collapse, we're left with the void of it just being us and just being our ideas and just being this reality that surrounds us and this central pillar of external meaning that was Jesus and that was Allah and was Vishnu become become nil. Siri Krishna. Yes, yes. one of the hundreds and hundreds. God is dead. 
and we've killed him murderers of murderers yeah dude i mean that whole thing is kind of just uh that's humanity kind of developing the scientific method that's Going humanity up. saying wait a minute you know i'm starting to question this belief and that's kind of the yeah death exactly god, it's, right? it's it's as god dies we emerge ourselves we realize like god mm. it, it's a strange concept to say that the concept of god dies when it has never existed in the first place and it was only ever our infancy coping with this scary world that we've manifest within but we as we kill god as we overcome the concept of god we realize that it was only ever us it was only ever minds and us people and our our interactions that has been the foundation of such things as meaning and purpose yeah it's i mean i always like to say you know um it's man who created god in his own image definitely right i mean you know i mean i like to classify myself as an agnostic you know like I mean, obviously, I'm kind of just sitting here in my simulation of a mind. Like, I can't really uh, uh, know for certain what exists outside of my own mind. But what I do know is what I experience, if, right? And I'm taking things from what I experience. I think everyone, there's a, there's a common misunderstanding between atheism and uh, agnosticism in that uh, agnosticism yeah. is about uh knowledge it's about what you you can and can't know and i think technically everyone is agnostic because you can't be certain about literally anything you could be simulated running on a a flash drive in someone's pocket uh but with uh with agnosticism it's it's a claim to knowledge it's about knowing or not knowing and if you're you're agnostic then you believe you know things and if you're agnostic then you're honest in in saying that things can't be known but atheism is more about belief it's a claim that the proposition God's exist is made. And then yes. atheist is one, someone who says, well, I don't believe in that proposition. Uh, so like you can be an agnostic mm-hmm. atheist in that you don't believe and you also don't know, or you can be uh, a theistic agnostic in that you believe in a God, but you don't know for sure. Or like they're, they're, it, it becomes a, a four yeah. by four grid of the, the two terms. Yeah, that makes sense. I haven't really thought of it that way. It is sort of a, one of those things i mean you can't the thing about being agnostic is that you can't be too agnostic right because if you deny everything if you're just a total skeptic you take it from a completely phenomenological basis of your own experience then you might miss the chance of a of a um kind of playing with i think uh, philosophical razors are very useful for escaping your own fan or on Escaping your own, uh, I forget who coined the term Phaneron, but Phaneron is essentially the entirety of what you are currently experiencing, like your entire, yeah, your your individual perception and the entirety of what goes on in your world, your entire universe as centered through you, but like you can't possibly know what exists outside of your Phaneron because you're not there, you can't, you can't know what sounds are being perceived by sections of the wall or like what a chicken is feeling or like it, it's stuff that, oh, well, not yeah, on yeah, it was, it was on Vsauce, exactly, that's where I learned right? that word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude. But like, uh, we're all trapped within <laughs> our individual phaneron, but we can use tools like science and like awareness of of uh, philosophical fallacies and and razors uh, in order to to sort of prune our understanding towards what is most likely actually true. Like, we might never actually get to a point where we understand what is true, but we'll get closer and closer by analyzing yeah. and and. I think the key to truth is understanding or sorry, is questioning the things that you like want to be true over and over again. Like the things that you think are true, just keep analyzing them until yes. you've distilled it down to what is most likely actually true. But then when you get there, well, that's a yeah, scientific yeah. method. When you, when you get there, never conclude, never hold an idea as absolute and complete because there's no such thing. Every concept can be expanded upon. There's more perspectives and context information than mm. can be perceived by an individual brain in an individual moment and you will never know anything and no one will ever know anything but the game of science and the game of the human experiment is in attempting to figure out honestly what you can about yeah. reality while you exist as a mind capable of doing so but the key word is honestly you have to mm. be willing to like let go of the things that you wish to be true and focus on the actual information itself removing yourself from the equation because if you put yourself in the equation, then you're going to mislead yourself towards things that 
that reaffirm and and like comfort you and make you like make the beliefs and the things that you want to be yes. true like you confirmation bias essentially is what it boils down to you start to uh you start to confirm and seek information that reaffirms the things that you that you wish well no matter what you're going to be in the equation somehow because you are the you're center the but experience. like right. in the pursuit of your you're the one that's uh, yeah you're the one that's navigating through the you're, labyrinth you're the center right? you're the very center of the universe like you yeah. it is from mm-hmm. the perspective yes, of you yes. that this entire mm-hmm. game manifests like outside of these thoughts that you're having right now there is nothing there is it is only through you that all of it has context so you're always going to be a part of the equation but if you want to figure out what actually is going on in the actual world you have to try as much as you can to avoid like the you part like science is a good 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 method of because what you feel and what you think about certain things will be different to a guy sitting next to you so with a a method like science we break down the barriers of intersubjectivity and figure out like what is actually true of reality independent of what the individual phanerons are manifesting for the individual Hmm. it's very it's very sisyphian sisyphian it's um yeah, Sisyphusian. No, however, I got what you meant. However, you want to say it, um, because I mean we're all kind of you know struggling to find the truth, right? And then someone knocks down our our current conception, or we yeah. knock it down ourselves, and then you know we have to walk back down and think, okay, what am I going to do next? What's my next struggle, right? What's my mm. next uh, turn through the labyrinth? of uh, knowledge and it's weird because it's an infinite labyrinth and there's no center you'll always just keep going and going and keep finding yes. information and knowledge but like there's no one single absolute truth to find like you'll, you'll come to understand different dimensions of things in different ways through different perspectives and it'll change and, and shift your entire understanding of the world and of of being but you'll never come to an ultimate truth or an ultimate meaning and indeed to search for such a thing is fallacy because no such thing exists or ever has existed. It's just us idealizing such concepts as purpose and meaning to the point where they become external things to search for. When in reality, if you want to find peace, you've got to manifest it within yourself. And if you want meaning, you have to create meaning within yourself and you have to reason through what meaning is of actual value to you and what like purpose is worth defining yourself. Yeah. Well, that's um, because you sent me this note. You said, uh, in context to how I presented nihilism, existentialism becomes a pursuit of the self made meaning in awareness of its subjective nature. It is the absurd but temporary defiance of the inevitable void through a reasoned affirmation of one's values. Indeed. A reasoned affirmation to, uh, to go through and to reanalyze the things that you you deem worthy and worthy of of valuing and uh, attributing meaning to in context of your awareness of things like death or of the uh, inherent subjectivity of meaning. Mm. And I think uh, one important thing is to kind of, uh, you know, like we said earlier, you know, don't be enslaved by ideals, but one way to not be enslaved by ideals is taking the whole world as your teacher. Of course, of course, never, uh, I'm taking it all right. Being aware. Never adhere completely to one individual philosophy or mindset. Never, never cut yourself off from Mm. more potential ideas and potentially questioning things that you think you've settled on things that you've like, Oh, I know all I need to know about that subject. Well, no, like there's always something new to comprehend and something like that. You never know when the next profound world shaping realization is going to come across your path and if you if you stagnate if you shut yourself off because oh i found jesus and i know the truth or oh i i i understand that gods are false and i don't need to know existentialism and like if you've cut yourself off at any point then you've limited what it is to be a conscious agent in the first place this pursuit of mm-hmm. understanding this the silly sisyphusian game of of trying to figure out what the heck is is going on in this this whole life thing Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, and, you know, just uh, adhering to the ideology that you need to be addicted to some substance, like, over and over again, like, all the time, forever, right? I mean, that, too, is kind of cutting yourself off from 
things or, or adhering to the ideology that, oh, I need to work 12 hours a day every single day because I want to uh, continue being a yeah. billionaire. Or even if right. you like become to the point where you identify by your work and if you don't work that many hours a day, then you start to look at yourself as less worthy, less like valuable and less of a person. You start to think less of yourself. Any ideals that you that you ascribe in your life and that, or that you adhere to in your life, you should never adhere to so much that they end up shaping how you view yourself and shaping like your core identity and it ends up warping. Because I've always been of the, the mindset that the, the more you invest in ideas like vanity or in like uh in concepts like your work being what defines you or religion being what defines you the more you do these things the less you are yourself like the more you invest in these ideas that are external that aren't even of you the less you are you because the thing that is you is the individual that manifests from the 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 honed reasoning and the the inquisitive philosophy Yeah, I mean, don't be a slave yeah. of your ideals. Make your ideals a slave of yeah, yours. exactly. Right. And that's kind of, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the three metamorphoses. I vaguely. Uh, from, from Zarathustra. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, tr- the lion, the child, and the uh, camel. Not in that order. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's camel, yes. lion, child. It's because uh, I get first, you're a slave, right? And then while you're a slave, you start, you know, getting all depressed. You're like, ah, oh, God, I, I hate being trapped by this ideal, right? Like the so, burden to uh, this ideal ideas. that society has put upon me. Yes, yes. And then, and then you become the lion, right? And then you try to destroy those ideals. And then once you've destroyed those ideals, you can finally be a child who's creative and yeah, you it's, care it's it's about re, whatever. Uh, right? In the state of the child, you reform and you like look at the world with mm. eyes that are untainted by these perceptions and value systems that are put on you by others as you develop like that aren't of your own. Yes. And I think that key to becoming uh, Nietzsche's Ubermensch, Ubermensch is in, uh, in internalizing these things and internalizing the uh, individual yeah. existential responsibility of refining your own system of reason values and of like having none, mm. none of your systems of values stand on their own as just granted just because like you want to adhere to them every single thing that you that you attribute value and meaning to has to be true has to be like reasoned and of you it can't just be taken as granted or given as granted or internalized as granted yeah i mean don't take like any of this for granted um in general i mean like not just uh you know, like, don't just like say, oh, that's, I mean, they told me that this is how it is. So that's how it it's is. Weird how right? many people stick to um, that mindset? Yeah. It's almost scary yes, yes. to think how many minds have lived their entire, entire perception, their entire life without ever coming to terms with the reality of their existence. Like they, they were born, they had these ideas put onto yeah. them. They lived out their entire life as a camel and then the abyss ate them up again. Like they, it, yeah, it's, it's suck. almost <laughs> like an absurd comedy to it but it's also really scary and sad that there's so many people that live their entire existence unaware of the fact that they're headed towards oblivion and unaware of the fact that like life is crazy and like how, what the fuck how like i'm i'm a brain i'm having thoughts i'm like just all these yeah or how it manifests and like what we are in context of the the vaster universe or like what scales reality go to on the smallest and how just the, the actual context of the actual world that people live in. They, they get so stuck in mm. systems of value that they are born into that they never see through it. They never once comprehend what they actually are as a self, as a, as an individual fan or on. Yeah. And like they're missing out. Cause you know, when you have that existential dread, dread and it's like terrifying, like, Oh God, like, what is this like this is just so weird it's dread, like, but it's also like i'm going to die like but heck man that's awesome it's crazy like, that you're even here at like, all. like this is my life i'm living yeah it's, exactly it's existential dread but it's also existential wonder like there's also like a deep mm-hmm. a deep wonder to it once you've internalized the reality of the situation that you manifest from nothing from water and from vitamins and from chemicals interacting in such a way as to to cause certain feedback loops inside of 
inside of your brain as to make you think that you're yourself <coughs> and to to even be here at all it's it's easy to take it as granted if you think that you're eternal if you think that like gods exist and like souls are eternal it's easy to not be in awe of the very fact that you're having thoughts right now the very fact that you can make yeah. meaning out of sounds and communicate information to other brains who are also experiencing realities like you miss so much of what is actually reality when you refuse to allow yourself to comprehend dark things like death hmm. well it's it's the allegory of the yeah, cave, no, definitely right? definitely that's what it is people i mean and and some people they they see the outside and then they run yeah, right that's back just terrifying. They thought they'll have an existential crisis, crisis once, they'll doubt themselves once, but then they'll go right back into the things that comfort them. <clears throat> but it's beautiful. It's profound. It's, it provides so much more context and perspective to your perception of the whole reality thing than you can ever get if you stick to the methods of thinking that are just about self-reaffirmation and, and about indulging in, oh, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to see grandma again. I'm going to... I'm going to live forever. I'm going to meet my Jesus and he's going to tell me what I did wrong or did right. And then he's going to put me in the good place. Not the bad place. He never puts me in the bad place because I've always been good. But, like that's what people think always. They never think they're going to hell. But like, it, it's easy. You lose so much context of like the awe and wonder that surrounds you in life when you allow yourself to just dive into the things that yeah. comfort you away from the things that are disheartening and scary at first, like comprehending death. Well, here's the thing, man. Like, even if you did go to heaven, you still have to deal with the fact, oh, no, I'm stuck up here forever. <laughs> if I manifested it in heaven or hell, right. I would instantly conclude that I am indeed inside of a simulation. I'd be like, well, that my brain is mush and I am still here. Therefore, I must be on a hard drive. Or like some alien is fucking with me and copied yeah. my consciousness before I died. Like, I wouldn't conclude, oh, magical Jesus from the ancient history books. I would be like, okay, well, what is actually likely of this situation? Am I, well, it turns out my, my body wasn't attached to, or my, my mind and soul wasn't attached to the body. So I, I guess that's cool. I guess I could get to exist more, but oh no, I'm on fire and everyone is being ripped apart around me. <laughs> so this is a bad simulation. But <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's funny. It's funny all the different ways that people try to, to get around the fact that life can be scary at times and that death is is an unfortunate reality of our situation. It well, it's the it's the ultimate and necessary price for your existence. Yeah, it's you were damned into being by people who like I, I've always viewed it this way myself that I've been damned into being by people who themselves did not comprehend death. Uh, like I, people who didn't understand what death was, they decided to manifest me into the world as a way, as a pillar of their purpose, of their idea of, of uh, like a, a way to, to circumvent mortality. Uh, so I exist now and I, I didn't exist for most of time and I won't exist ever again. So I may as well try to figure out what the fuck is going on and try to appreciate perception and existence while I exist as a mind capable of doing so because I'm never going to be this way again I'm never going to be arranged in such a way as to have thoughts again and I never was for billions of years even though I, I didn't miss it I didn't know it because I wasn't aware but like I, I was just there drifting and now all of a sudden I'm I'm here I'm I was a bunch of piles of food and water but now I'm arranged as a human and yeah I'm gonna do the the life thing and try to figure out what the fuck is going on honestly while I do so and and while I'm here I'm not going to give into my fear of the overwhelming void that surrounds me in every direction i'm gonna mm. i'm gonna face that void i'm gonna face the abyss and try to create something within it and try to make sense of it even if i may never make complete sense of it because like i i exist i am a mind capable of comprehending reality and why would i not mm -hmm. want to comprehend reality while i exist as a mind capable of doing that yeah, man, don't let the the dragon of death yeah, burn no, you it's, down. Uh, it's scary at first, death. When you first, I think it's mostly, someone commented on one of my videos, uh, and it, they made a really good point, how death is only scary because we've come become so accustomed to believing that there's more. We've become so accustomed culturally and yeah. uh, individually to thinking that we get more than this, that there's going to be an afterlife where you see your grandma, and but we get more and gods exist it becomes reality becomes disappointing and scary only in 
relation to that delusion that we fed ourselves for so long or that yeah yeah i mean a lot of tribal peoples aren't very afraid yeah, of death. It's, well the, the thing is you lose your fear of death when you don't believe that death is death so tribal peoples and like really devout uh muslims or christians they lose that fear of death because they don't believe that death is death when you've convinced yourself that death is not a thing that exists and that you're just going somewhere else, death doesn't become scary because it's not death anymore. It's not real anymore. So that's a one way to deal with the fear of death is to deny it entirely. Yeah. And that, I mean, that could be very problematic. Yeah, It makes you lose sight of life of like the value of treating people like, and valuing like starving people and like homing sheltering people and like, treating people with respect and value in this current life because if you believe that there's more than you lose sight of the reality that this is all there is and the suffering that these people experience like a five-year-old who dies of of malaria without ever knowing peace in their entire short life like that that was their entire existence that was their entire thing they don't get some magical place where they're in peace forever in the arms of an angel like it's unfortunate and it's sad but it makes it real it makes it urgent because it now infinitely matters to save that child and to save people who suffer because this is the one and only situation in which they manifest as a consciousness and have a life and if we let them die and we let them suffer then that was their life that was their absurd existence yeah i think also like saying that being good yeah there's going to be a reward if you're good, I think being good should have Definitely. intrinsic value, think, not yeah, extrinsic, the, the, not the extrinsic dichotomy value. of reward and punishment, the carrot and stick is not, is not a core for morality. People think that uh, you can't have morality without religion, but religion proposes a morality centered, centered around reward and punishment. And that isn't morality. The only reason that it is good to mm-hmm. feed someone is because you are reducing that person's hunger. The only reason that it is good to clothe someone is that you are reducing the amount that they are cold. The like, it's not that you yourself will feel better for have helping having helped them, or that yeah. you will get rewarded by some external being of some kind. The only reason that good has any value is because of the good act itself. Same with bad things. Same with hurting people. The only reason that that's bad is because a god says so. It's because you are making a consciousness suffer. You are making a mind have a worse experience than it would have had you not intervened. Mm. So morality becomes more real when you realize that death is a thing. And then when you realize that gods aren't real, because it's centered entirely around this thing that we are all in right now. Yeah, this is this has been great. (sighs) Man. Yeah, dude, that was that was awesome, man. Uh, are, See, are I you have, coming out with uh, any? I've got like more videos, a anytime? bunch of scripts, like plans for about seventeen other videos and whatnot, like a bunch, a bunch, cool. a bunch of thoughts and stuff that I haven't even completely wrote out. But I'm going through uh, through some personal shit that has demotivated my uh, my ability to to actualize them. Like even my hobbies have become chores, and my depression has really crushed me lately. So I haven't uploaded in about three months. And though the channel keeps growing fucking crazily i don't have any idea how uh it's, it's crazy like i, I uploaded shit and somehow people like it and i'm like what okay cool yeah no it's uh even yeah that's yeah good. even your your introduction yeah dude that's gotta uh, feel how you good introduced it is awesome stuff that really made me smile uh, i'm glad that it affects people in uh in a positive way and that it's of, of value to people but uh yeah i'm uh i'm just going through through struggles and shit and the youtube channel is still alive it isn't dead and i will eventually eventually probably upload again and put effort into into making more content it's just that i'm having a hard time staying alive each day <laughs> nowadays yeah no it's uh it's not you gotta resurrect will, it uh, bro i just i i put in in uh in the description <laughs> of all the videos uh subscribe as an indication as, uh, of a desire for more content yeah the channel is is there yeah. and the content that is on it the ideas are uh of value to, to some people i'm sure and i will i will eventually do more on it all right well that's uh that is niall alexander everybody thanks for listening and we'll be back right at you next week